Welcome to the presentation of a lecture from Gnostic Radio, a free public service from Telema Press. Gnostic Radio broadcasts free lectures from the Gnostic tradition of Samael on Vior. Each lecture explores another aspect of this timeless and sacred knowledge. Many of these lectures are supported by additional materials available on our website. Each Saturday, Gnostic Radio broadcasts live. The live lecture is accompanied by an anonymous chat session allowing listeners to read additional explanations related to the lecture and providing an opportunity to ask questions of the speaker. All of the efforts of Telema Press, including this lecture, are made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Help us to help humanity by making a donation. Telema Press is a non-profit corporation. Donations are tax-deductible. For more information, visit our website at GnosticTeachings.org. Now, with heartfelt wishes for the end of suffering for all creatures, we begin the lecture. May all beings be happy. If we open the eyes of our imagination and reflect upon the incredible sophistication of this human organism and vividly imagine all of the intricate systems which are interrelated and interdependent that constitute the organism that we inhabit. We would see a very complex, very beautiful machine that functions without our direct intervention or without our direct will. We could see the marvelous processes of our digestion, of our circulatory system, of the endocrine system, and all the other processes that make possible this very moment that we're experiencing. The organism that we are all seated within is constantly active with many processes and transformations about which we remain unaware, but whose marvelous power is evident and undeniable. In some corners of our science and wisdom, <clears throat> we've heard it stated that the human organism is comparable to an iceberg, which, as you know, rests in the waters of the ocean. And only a very small percentage of that structure is visible from the surface. The majority of it is submerged and hidden from the eyes of the flesh. And our human organism is no exception. What we perceive with our physical eyes is merely one small percentage of the structure that constitutes our physiology and, importantly, our psychology. In order for us to truly understand our place in the universe, it is important for us to truly understand 
this organism that we inhabit and its purpose. If we again call upon the spectacular powers of our imagination and we look with our mind's eye at the entirety of this planet, we can see a huge globe which has a very thin film or skin wrapped across its surface. And within and upon that thin layer of life <clears throat> interact a multitude of organisms of varying degrees of sophistication and power. And with our imagination, we can see that all of those organisms, each in its own way, contributes to the economy and health of the organism upon which they live, this planet Earth. All of the minerals and plants and animals constitute the organs of this Earth. Or, in other words, devices or machines that perform particular tasks. By, reason, by means of analogy, we can see a comparable situation within our own physical body. When we see the varying degrees of systems that manage our own health and life. The organs each perform certain tasks in harmony with the other systems and other organs. So within this analogy, we can refer back again to the earth and see how all the plants and trees perform a particular function which must remain in harmony with the functions performed by the animals or by the minerals. We know, of course, in our modern science that within any given ecosystem, there is a very delicate balance that nature manages. And when an ecosystem is left on its own without the interference of external forces, such as man, that ecosystem, with a careful, delicate orchestra, orchestration, rather, of all its parts, the minerals, the plants, and the animals, achieves a certain process of development, a certain kind of balance, within which each of those component parts contributes towards the health of the whole. And in that way, we can see that all of the different creatures upon this planet contribute to the reciprocal nourishment of the system within which they live. Naturally, in these times, we find a striking exception to this cohesive system or pervasive system, and that exception is us. We, as organisms that populate the face of this planet, do not contribute in a beneficial way to the ecosystems that we inhabit. We instead unbalance them. We create disequilibrium in each ecosystem that we inhabit. The consequences of this are becoming more and more evident on a daily basis. But this situation, as dire as it may be, is only a pale reflection of its source, which is the disequilibrium of our own psyche. There's a great deal of attention being paid to the consequences of our actions in this environment in which we live. And in these times, there are a lot of groups who are shouting about pollution, about global warming, about nuclear waste, and many of the other problems that afflict this earth. And yet, none of these problems can be solved so long as the source of the problem remains as it is, and that source is our own mind. This is the point of this teaching, is to go to the source. 
to deal with the cause and upon which the effect will be naturally nullified. So returning to our analysis of our own inner cosmos, the physical body, we can see that this structure is really formidable. It is truly incomprehensible to our current mind because of its great beauty and great sophistication. And really, we don't need to do much in order to maintain its existence. We have certain procedures that we have to follow in order to sustain our life to some measure of health. And these, of course, include eating and drinking, breathing. But there's more to it than that. Really, this organism has a purpose and has functions about which we barely suspect. When we look at the systems of this body, we see, of course, that it has uh, a collection of glands and a collection that we call the nervous system, which can be divided in various ways. And these systems are intermediaries, meaning that they're transformers. They receive, transform, and transmit energies. The human organism is a machine. Like any machine, it has a function. And that function is to work with matter and energy in order to achieve a particular goal. When we look at plants and animals and minerals, we can surmise to some degree a percentage of their functions and how they transmit energy. They ingest, transform, and transmit energy. But our human organism is no exception. We take in a great number of in energetic influences. Food, air, water, and impressions. All of these types of food are constantly entering into our organism in one form or another. And this organism transforms those energies and then transmits the altered result. So why is that? When we observe how plants, for example, receive solar light, water, and minerals, we can see, just in the physical level, how they transform those elements and release changed elements. And those changed elements, in turn, benefit the system that they inhabit. So a plant, for example, will ingest certain gaseous elements and then release others. And this, in turn, benefits its environment. The human, human organism, in its base conception, in its base function, is the same. The human organism is a machine that transforms energy in order to nourish the earth. But unfortunately, this machine has become corrupt. The machine has developed a very severe problem. And now, instead of contributing to the nourishment of the planet and the nourishment of our ecosystem, we are destroying it. Really, the way that the human machine lives now is as a machine. A mechanical vehicle that behaves according to a pre-programmed route that takes in many elements and releases them without any cognizance whatsoever. Without any consciousness of what it is doing. We can see this in the behavior of humanity and the way we move as groups, motivated by impulses which we scarcely perceive. Unfortunately, in these times, this mechanism or mechanicity has entered into a very disturbing phase. And this is because a long time ago, there was a certain 
error that was made. In any normal situation, the human organism would contribute in a beneficial way to its environment in the way that it receives, transforms, and transmits energy. It would, in turn, benefit all of the creatures that exist around it. And in ancient times, this was the case. This is symbolized in the Bible by the Garden of Eden, a time of great peaceful, peacefulness and reciprocal health. But unfortunately, there was a certain error that occurred when the human machines of that age began to realize that they were simply machines without a grand purpose. When that realization began to occur to them, they, of course, became despaired. And so in order to advance the process of the evolution of the species and prevent that despair from becoming prohibitive, the guides of humanity placed within the organism a new organ. An organ which, in the evolution of any human race, is always placed there in order to facilitate the, the relationship or to develop the relationship between the organism and its environment. And this organ is called the Kunda buffer. At that time, the Kunda buffer, being introduced into the human organism, cultivated more of a relationship with matter, with sensation, which helped that race forget or, or not be concerned about this aspect of being a mere machine and instead gave them the appreciation for the environment within which they lived. But unfortunately, due to certain karmic influences, when this organ was finally removed so that the evolution of the species could continue, a certain shadow remained, a shadow of that desire towards energy and matter. And it's from this shadow that the I emerged, the ego, the desire for sensation. Since that time, such a long time ago, this I has developed itself. This ego, this shadow, has become grotesque and has, in fact, infected the entire psyche of humanity and has become a multiplicity of illnesses, sicknesses and diseases that we call pride and lust and envy and greed and hate. This I, this shadow, has infected our entire psyche. And now with this persistent desire or craving for sensation, the human machine has become enslaved by the lust for sensations and is now worse than any animal. The human machine now seeks only its own satisfaction at any expense. And this is why we see human organisms who, in their craving for sensation, will poison themselves, will destroy their own psychology, their own physiology, with drugs, with alcohol, with fornication, simply because of the craving for sensation, that desire. Therefore, in this state, the human organism is no longer contributing to the reciprocal nourishment of its environment. It is instead destroying itself and destroying everything around it. There is a key or a clue which will help us to transform this situation. When we look closely at our own psychology, we can see that all of the different psychological manifestations that we experience 
can be organized or understood as having certain um, qualities. Or in other words, they occur according to a certain organization in the psyche. In the occult tradition or the hidden tradition, we look at the human organism or the human psyche as having five fundamental psychological centers. And these are aspects of psychological manifestations, how our own psyche works. These five centers are the intellectual, the emotional, the motor, the instinctual, and the sexual. Each of these five centers completely pervade the organism. And yet, if we observe ourselves carefully, we can see that they each have a particular center of gravity or a root location or relationship with some part of the body. The intellectual center has its center of gravity in the brain. The emotional center has its center of gravity in the chest, the solar plexus, and the heart. The motor center is, is, uh, has its center of gravity at the top of the spine. The instinctual center has its motor center at the base, or has its center of gravity at the base of the spine. And the sexual center clearly has its center of gravity in the sexual organs. Each one of these centers has specific functions and has specific capacities. It's clear when we observe ourselves that the intellectual center is that part of our psyche related to thought, to the process of reasoning, to the process of thinking. And this is, of course, clearly evident that nowadays science presumes that our entire intelligence is simply in the brain. But again, we state in this tradition that the brain is simply the seat of the intellectual center while it also contributes to other functions in the body. But the brain itself is not the mind. Neither is it the intellect itself. It is simply a vehicle. The emotional center, of course, is that part of our psyche where our feelings process. Feelings of like and dislike. Feelings of any kind of emotional quality. Joy or despair. In the motor center, or the center of movement, related to the top of the spine, is where we develop and acquire the abilities that we have with our physical body. When we learn how to type, or we learn how to ride a bicycle, that is a process of training the motor center and giving it that skill, which it then just repeats. The instinctual center, which is, has its center of gravity at the base of the spine, is that root psychological component within which we find many of our animal behaviors, such as the instinct for self-preservation, to fight or to run. Many base instincts are rooted in this part of the psyche. And then finally, of course, we have the sexual center related to the sexual organs. And it's in this center that we have all of the sexual impulses which motivate the entire psyche. When we begin this process of learning about our psyche and observing ourselves, 
I'm trying to comprehend how our mind functions. It becomes evident that each of these five centers has its own particular functions and also a great variety of speed. It's assumed in this modern world that the intellect is the most superior of these centers. And it's assumed that it is the fastest and has the most power. But actually, the opposite is true. The intellectual center is the slowest of all of the centers. And when you begin to seriously self-observe and become mindful of your psyche from moment to moment, you will quickly encounter this fact. The emotional center is faster. The motor instinctive center is faster. The sexual center is faster. All of these components of our psyche move at much greater speed than the intellect. And this can be shown in many examples. When you're driving your car and someone leaps in front of you, who acts first in your psyche? <clears throat> Instinct, motor, emotion, all of these arise well before you can even think of what has happened. Before any thought comes, you will have reacted and moved with the car and felt that surge of emotion, fear or concern. Then afterward, the thoughts come. In actual fact, we can see that the intellectual center is the slowest A little bit faster, about 30 times, 30,000 times faster, is the motor and instinctive centers. And these two function at comparable speeds, close to the same. But nonetheless, they are 30,000 times faster than the intellect. And faster still is the emotional center which is another 30,000 times faster than the motor and instinctive. And yet, clearly, the most rapid, the most potent center of all is the sexual. It is with good cause that Freud stated that sex is the center of gravity of the human mind. It is the central axis upon which our psyche functions. And this is an undeniable fact. And it's for this reason that true religion, true spirituality, is always rooted in sexuality. Because the sexual brain, or the sexual center, has the single, singular power of being able to transform any other center. To completely revolutionize the organism. The, only, the center with the most potency, the most power, the most force, the most capacity to create an impulse or a movement in a person is the sexual center. It is the fastest and the deepest and also the most difficult to control. When we learn about these centers in our self-observation, we see that they all rely on a kind of duality. For and against, yes and no. The intellect develops ideas, thesis and antithesis. Ideas for, ideas against. The emotional center has emotional qualities that are either pleasant or unpleasant. But we also find the same dualism in the sexual center with attraction and repulsion. So we can see that all of these centers are both positive and negative. But they are in themselves simply machines. Each center 
is simply a transformer. Each one simply takes given energies, transforms them, and transmits the result. So then, as a student of any religion or spiritual system, it becomes vital for us to know where are those energies coming from, how do they transform it, and how do they transmit it. We have to know and see and understand how impulses arise in our mind. Where do our thoughts come from? Why do we think the things that we do? Are these thoughts our own thoughts, or are they someone else's? The same with our emotions. What emotions arise in us from moment to moment, from day to day? Why do they arise? What stimulates them? What are the energies, the influences that are impacting our emotional center? And how are we transforming those influences? And how, in turn, are we transmitting emotional energy out of ourselves? By observing and analyzing constantly, consciously, from moment to moment, the functions of these five centers, we can start to grasp something of our true state, our true purpose. The most important of these is the sexual. It becomes somewhat easy to observe and analyze the process of thinking. And with a certain amount of effort, it becomes somewhat easy to control the process of thought, to even arrest thought. But it becomes more difficult when we try to do the same with our motor instinctive center. And yet, even here, we can achieve a certain degree of success when we learn certain habits or unlearn certain habits. But when we try to approach the emotional center, the difficulties become immense because the emotional center is so fast and so strong. If you've ever tried to control your anger, you know what I'm talking about. Emotions are very powerful, and yet they are less powerful than the sexual impulses. The most difficult center to control is the sexual center. It is the single most potent, powerful source of energy within our organism. And it's the most difficult to be consciously in charge of. The sexual center works so fast and with so much energy that we generally are just slaves to it. The sexual center can identify a sexual complement, someone who's complementary to us, someone who has a sexual affinity with us, almost instantly. Faster than we can think about it, faster than we can feel any emotion, faster than we can even act through our motor or instinctive centers. The sexual center will be able to identify a person that we find attractive before we can exercise any of our own will. And you can observe this in yourself at any moment. After this lecture, you may find yourself outside and discover how fast sexual attraction or sexual repulsion can arise before thought, before emotion, before any motor action, even before instinct. And this, of course, is the great difficulty. As the most potent center in the human organism, it is the greatest source of power 
that we have. And this is why all the great religions and mystical traditions rely upon the sexual center as their source of power, the source of transformation, the source of rebirth. But to do that requires that we gain control over this center. The sexual instinct is the greatest urge that we will ever feel. The sexual instinct completely dominates the rest of the mind. It completely dominates the entire organism. Of all of our thousands of desires of all of our millions of cravings, none can overcome the sexual one. It is the central desire. The desire for money, the desire for fame, for children, for properties, for recognition, for respect, all of these are secondary behind the sexual desire. When we look closely at the world, we can see two fundamental factors which produce impulses and motivations in the psyche of mankind. Sex and ego. And this is why the world is in the state that it is. Because these two impulses are not being consciously managed. Instead, sexual desire and egotistical desire have completely gained control over the entire human machine. And now the human organisms run around from here to there, doing all of their activities, driven firstly by sexual desire and secondly by egotistical desire, by pride, by anger, by envy, by jealousy, by fear. Swami Shivananda wrote a very interesting paragraph about this. He said, Man has degraded himself to a great degree by becoming a puppet of passion. Alas, he has become an imitative machine. He has lost his power of discrimination. He has sunk into the most abject form of slavery. What a sad state. What a lamentable plight indeed. If he wishes to regain his lost divine state and Brahmic glory, his whole being must be transformed. His sex desire must be completely transmuted by sublime divine thoughts and regular meditation. Transmutation of the sex desire is a very potent, efficacious, and satisfactory way to realize eternal bliss. When we return again to utilizing the power of our imagination as we did in the beginning of this lecture and visualize and imagine this vast planet covered with all the organisms that exist. And we see the entire humanity as one organism, one functioning organ in that body of the earth. We can see that that organ is diseased, cancerous, very sick, And this is very sad. That sickness, that illness, is egotistical desire, which has many faces. Faces of pride, faces of fear, faces of hate. And that diseased organ is receiving and transforming energies and producing filth. Filth that's polluting the environment, polluting the earth, and polluting itself, polluting its own organism. And yet, the possibility exists to transform it. From the sexual power comes our destiny. As we use the sexual energy, so do we determine our future. So if we look at humanity now as that organ on the face of earth, and we compare, we analyze its use of sexual energy, and we see that that sexual functionalism 
has been entirely rooted in desire, in egotistical desire, in lust. We can see what the man, the human organism, the human machine has become little more than an animal fighting to survive. No knowledge of the future, no knowledge of itself. Living in fear, living in terror, consumed by stress, by uncertainty, afflicted with all manner of illnesses, both psychological and physical, unable to produce great art, great joy, great insight. There have been some exceptions, thankfully. But in general, the human organism is degenerating. Our society is becoming worse. As much as we invent, as much as we theorize, suffering is increasing. The complications of life are becoming more complex. Our environment is struggling to stay afloat. Our human population is consuming itself with hatred, with fear, with the fires of passion. Within this fifth center, the sexual center, resides the power to change that. This power in India is called Kundalini. In the Bible, it's called the Holy Spirit. This is a sexual fire the transmuted energy of that center, made pure and harnessed by will in order to purify the mind, to clean the mind of the ego, to resolve the equation of life. But unfortunately, in this moment, the five centers are infected with the disease, the disease of the I, the ego. That I, that ego, must be removed, must be cleansed from the psyche in order for that divine fire to have its full expression. And fortunately, it is the divine fire itself which provides the means to do it. When the sexual fire or the sexual energy is harnessed and controlled, when it's transformed by conscious will, that energy can be directed can be focused, can be controlled. And it's that capacity which gives us the power to conquer desire, to conquer the ego. At the moment, our consciousness is trapped inside the ego. We are constantly buffeted with desires in the intellect, in the emotional center, in the sexual center. And we willingly remain enslaved to those things. Some spiritually minded people enter into the process of trying to control the mind, to calm the mind, to work on the ego. They learn meditation. They learn mindfulness. But the only way to completely eradicate the ego is by harnessing the sexual fire by harnessing that power, which is a divine power. This is the power of Shakti, the power of Dumo, the Divine Mother, this great wisdom force, which is the power of Athena, the power of Minerva, the goddess. Until that time until we start to develop that power, that ability within our own psyche. We need to learn about how our own psyche functions because no element in our mind can be removed until we've understood it. We can't become free of a mistake until we've understood the mistake, until we've comprehended why it's a mistake. Each of these five centers is always receiving 
and transforming influences. And there are two great sources for these influences. Two that we need to be immediately concerned with. The first one are all the radiations that are entering into us from outside. All the influences that are affecting us from outside the organism. And these radiations or energetic influences arrive from a variety of sources. The most widespread and most difficult to perceive are cosmic. These are irradiations that arrive to our planet from other stellar bodies and which exercise an influence over our psyche. We know that the moon, in its movements, influences all manner of processes on the earth. The tides, gestation, conception, menstruation. And when we consider that the physical body alone is comprised mostly of water, then we can see that the same way the moon affects the oceans, it also affects the body. But unfortunately, we're so asleep, we're not aware of that influence. But it's not simply the moon that affects us. It's the movement of other stellar bodies that also irradiate energies that influence our psyche. And this is why we have one of the most ancient sciences of our entire humanity, which is astrology. Which, unfortunately, in these times, has mostly lost its true use, its true function, which is to help us be aware of stellar influences so that we can be conscious and control of ourselves. Nowadays, it's just used for fortune telling or to give us an excuse for our bad habits. According to the teachings, we can see that humanity in its collective mind is moved about in its activities by some of these cosmic influences. The great world wars were partly due to karma, but also influenced by stellar forces which moved the human beings to become enraged, to become crazy, to become mad, and to enter into war, to kill each other, and to have all kinds of fancy justifications for their brutalities. The second influence is the ego, the I. And once again, we remain asleep, unconscious, unaware of how our ego stimulates our, in, our movements, our thoughts, our feelings. Really, the purpose of these studies is to become conscious of what we are unconscious of to make the unconsciousness conscious. And as we are now, we don't really truthfully know why we do what we do. Much of the time, the type of job that we do, the type of education we receive, the type of friends that we have, are all motivated by certain unconscious causes about which we ignore. We do all kinds of things that we really don't want to do in our heart. But we do them because of influences from the ego. Maybe we want to be accepted. Maybe we want others to admire us. Maybe we want respect. Maybe we want power. But of course, the most powerful cause is sexual. Much of what we do, in fact, perhaps all, is motivated by the desire for sex, for sexual fulfillment. We have these mistaken notions that if we dress a certain way, if we have a certain level of education, a certain amount of money in the bank, we will be sexually attractive. If we have a certain type of body or wear a certain hairstyle, that we will then be sexually attractive or if we have a certain level of education, or we have a certain accent. We mistakenly believe many things like this. 
And so we live our lives trying to acquire them. And this is why people have plastic surgery. And this is why we live like rats in a cage trying to acquire certain positions in society or in business. Completely enslaved by desires that we don't even see in our own minds. All of these influences make us very foolish because they constantly change. The problem with the the ego, not only that it produces suffering, it produces karma, but it has no individuality. It has no consistent will. And this is why on one day, when given influences, both environmental and psychological, bring a particular ego to the front, we feel that we are in love with a person. We feel so much love in our heart. And we feel it in our thoughts. We feel it in our body. And we feel it sexually. But then, a short time afterward, a different eye comes to the front. And we hate that person. We abhor them. They disgust us. And then a little later, maybe a different eye comes and we feel indifferent. We don't care about them at all. It's this form of inconsistency that gives us the clue or the doorway through which we can see that the eye is not one eye. It is many eyes. And in the Bible, its name is legion. In the Gospels, Jesus encounters a possessed man. And the man says, my name is Legion. And this story symbolizes how we are possessed by the legion of eyes, the legion of desires. All the egos that surge in our psyche, buffeted and called up by influences, both external and internal. We can see this as well when we come around certain types of people. If we have friends who drink, we may not on our own feel that urge to drink. But when we get around these other friends, that urge arises very strong and we want to drink. And this shows how the influence of the psyche of those friends calls up from our own submerged depths that desire for intoxication or that desire to be included or to be accepted or to be respected. And then later, when we're away from those friends, that desire goes away. We don't see it. It's still there in the depths of the mind, but submerged. We may also find that being in certain environments, one neighborhood or another neighborhood or a given city or in the country, entirely different elements emerge from within the mind. If you go to a bar, certain elements in your mind are brought up by that influence. If you go to a church, totally different elements will arise. If you go to a shopping mall, an entire new range of eyes will come out of the subconsciousness, called out by that influence. If you watch certain television shows or certain movies or read certain books, each one will stimulate and bring up different eyes. In every case, these eyes trap energy. They trap consciousness and they push the human machine to feed the eye, to make the eye stronger. We may not have any desire for money, but if we come in close contact with a rich person, that desire will be stimulated. That urge to work hard, to make money, will come up very strong. It is not necessarily our will but the will of that I, that ego. And so long as we remain exposed to that environmental influence, and as long as we continue to feed that I, it will get stronger. It will feed itself through this human machine so that that I can dominate that machine more and more and more. The end result is we subvert or we, we give up our own will 
We give up our own responsibility. We give up our right to live responsibly. Therefore, the purpose of this type of teaching is to learn how to eliminate this legion, to free ourselves from the psychological slavery that we live within, to liberate our will from desire so that we can act freely, responsibly, consciously for the benefit of all. To renounce selfish desire in order to comprehend and become conscious of how to benefit others. In this way, it becomes important for us to deeply study the I, to become cognizant of ourselves, of our decisions, to learn how to consciously control the five centers of our machine to consciously direct the forces of sex in order to dominate the rest of the centers. So in that way, we need to learn about these centers and how they function. We need to learn about ourselves, become conscious of ourselves. We need to be self-observant. When we're faced with any given situation, it's important for us to separate ourselves to become conscious of ourselves, to analyze how is this situation affecting me and why is my neighbor reacting so differently? Some people, when before a given situation, will only relate to that situation through their intellect and will rationalize, will reason. Some will react through their emotional center and will act, determine in a way determined by their feelings about it. Some will react automatically, habitually, instinctually. So we can see then that we have certain tendencies or habits in our psyche. Many of us are very intellectual in the way we relate to life, the way we relate to everything. We have to have good reasons. We have to have good We have to have certain ideas in place before we can do something. Many of us are very emotional in our way we deal with life. We rely on how we feel about something and driven by the impulse of emotion. And many of us are simply reactive, habitually, mechanically, without thought, without feeling. And this is how we see some people who will perform an action before they've really thought about it or understood how they felt. And only only later do they realize, I shouldn't have done that, or that was a mistake. So it's important for us to take a pause, to observe ourselves, to study our mind. But most importantly is to comprehend our use of sexual energy, to become deeply cognizant of how we utilize this energy, not only through sexual behaviors, but the way that sexual energy processes through the intellect and through the heart. The energies of each center must be kept in their place and must be managed consciously. It's important for us to comprehend that. This entire machine depends upon proper use of the energies of each center. The intellectual center, which functions at a given velocity, will be destroyed if we saturate it with very high octane energy, such as the sexual energy. But unfortunately, we do this. And this is why we see people who become sexual addicts lose their mental equilibrium. They can become crazy. This is why we can see people who become Emotional addicts destroy their intellectual center, destroy their emotional center, destroy their sexual center. People who become overly intellectual, who rationalize, who reason, 
who are always exploring things with the intellect, disequilibriate the intellect and go mad. These centers have to be maintained in a, in a good equilibrium. We have to use them responsibly. As a machine, we have to provide each center with a proper energy and carefully manage its use. It's a good practice for us to become aware of how we use these centers during the day. We might discover that we've never even felt what the emotional center is. And this is becoming very prevalent in these times. Many people don't feel emotion. They only feel themselves in the intellect. And some are the opposite. Some refuse to use the intellect and instead want to go through life entirely on an emotional basis. And some only want to go through life according to instinct, just fulfilling desires, never thinking about it, never concerned with their emotions. And these people clearly become totally morally bankrupt. They live their lives like animals, driven by one instinct or the next. The importance here is to become aware of our own level of consciousness. If our level of consciousness is completely enveloped in the desire for sensation, be that the sensations of the intellect through theorizing, through reading, through developing philosophies, or the sensations of the emotional center, sensations of romance, of pleasure, of love, of joy, of ecstasy, or even the, the sensations that people love to indulge in through horror movies, through violent displays, through any form of over-expressive or over-indulgent emotionality, or through indulging in habitual behaviors or instinctive or sexual behaviors. All of these are desires for sensation, and they constitute a given level of consciousness. And if we persist existing in that level of consciousness, behaving according to that level, the result will be only what can be produced there. More enslavement to desire. More enslavement to sensation. More karma. More suffering. If our intention, seriously, is to come to know something beyond the physical world, to perceive directly that which exists beyond physical sensation, that which exists beyond ideas, those realities which exist beyond beliefs, we have to move our consciousness to those levels. We have to move beyond the limited sphere of our current psyche. And this is done by awakening consciousness. This is done by freeing ourselves of desire, conquering the mind. This is not an easy thing, and it is not mechanical. It cannot arise on its own. Like anything in life, a given effect has a cause. The psyche that we have now is a cause, which as an effect can only produce the effects that we see in our society now chaos, suffering, blindness, spiritual blindness, spiritual darkness, great doubt, great skepticism, tremendous ignorance. The capacity to move beyond that is within yourself, is within your own human machine. By developing consciousness cognizant control over the five centers, you start to awake, awaken the consciousness. When you start to become conscious of your activities from moment to moment, you start to displace the ability of the I to control the human machine, to control your organism. 
you start to acquire a conscious control over this organism. And in that way, you start to acquire a conscious control over how the energies that enter into us are in turn transformed, transmuted, and transmitted. This is how any angel comes to be. Any Buddha, any prophet, any god. All the great masters of the past and of the present and of the future arrive to that state by developing completely pervasive cognizance over themselves so that every moment is a conscious act, a cognizant act, an act of conscious will. So long as we have an unconsciousness, influences that are affecting us without our awareness, then we are producing karmic consequences, suffering. All of that suffering, all of that chaos, confusion, and ignorance are rooted in desire, the I. So it's important for us to gain control of the human machine, to activate the consciousness, and to become deeply, deeply aware of ourselves. Any questions? Say we stop it and just don't watch it. Obviously, mechanically, it doesn't go away in terms of uh, the ego, you know, in terms of it's like the impressions are stored, right, of what we see. So mechanically, I guess we can't offset that. So how do we, I mean, the comprehension of visual waves, you know, mechanical waves? Any given ego needs food like anything. An ego is sustained in its existence in the same way that our organism is because it needs energy. When we watch television or movies, all the impressions are a kind of food that feed our psyche. So we have to be very selective. And the reason is we become what we eat. And you know that. If you eat fast food, or if you eat fake food, food that's just chemicals or heavily processed, you'll become sick. You'll become weak. The same is true of the psyche. If you feed your psyche fast food, it, it becomes that. It becomes a reflection of that. It becomes nourished by that. So when we watch <coughs> lustful things, lustful shows or very sentimental shows or books or movies, then we're feeding the ego with those energies. And it sustains itself. It becomes more perverse. So a student of this type of mysticism is advised to not watch those things, to deny that food to the ego, particularly any type of lustful, imagery. And what happens is that the egos of lust become angry. They become desperate. And they try anything they can to get food. If they can't get it through television, they'll get it through some other means. If they can't get it through external impressions like television or magazines or images, they'll do it through fantasies. Or they'll do it through dreams but they will try everything they can to feed themselves. This is why we have wet dreams, and this is why we have so many problems that cause suffering for us. And yet, this is the only way. That ego must be starved. Any ego, in order to kill it, has to be killed. You can't kill an ego and sustain it at the same time. 
So we have to learn how to be very judicious in our behaviors, in the types of foods that we ingest, not just physical food or air or water, but impressions through the eyes, through the ears, through our sense of touch. Little by little, those egos become starved. And what becomes most important at this point is meditation. Just because you're not feeding an ego right now does not mean that its existence has ended. There are a huge diversity of aggregates in the mind that sustain themselves in submerged levels of the mind, that sustain themselves on the filth that is within our mind, and we don't even see it. So just because physically we stop the behavior of watching certain things or ingesting certain kinds of imagery doesn't mean that we've stopped feeding those egos. The only way we can do that definitively is to kill those egos. And that's only possible through transmuting the sexual energy and through meditation. And that's a great work. Other questions? Yes. Okay. Transmutation, the transmutation of sexual energy begins by not having the orgasm by retaining those forces in the body, by containing and keeping all the potency of the sexual energy. So in the same way that when you boil water, it becomes steam, the sexual energy, when it's retained in the body, is transmuted, it's, pur it's purified, it's sublimated, it becomes a more elevated substance. And this substance, in turn, rises up through the nadis of the spinal column to the brain and then into the heart. And those forces and energies feed the consciousness. They feed our ability to become aware of ourselves. They give power to the soul. That energy, that power, is called the Divine Mother. Kundalini, the Holy Spirit. Bina, Shekinah. Dumo. That force is then utilized in meditation. And we learn how to direct the consciousness free of ego to examine any given phenomena in life. The consciousness extracts information, understanding, comprehension of that element. And when that comprehension is complete, that element can be evaporated, can be disintegrated. As an analogy, we can say that every <coughs> ego or every psychological element is a little cage, a little knot in the flow of existence within which is trapped consciousness. And when that sexual force strikes that bottle, that cage, it's shattered and that consciousness is freed. That trap, that karma is dissolved and that's liberation. So this is a process that goes on with great depth. If you've ever seen tantric imagery, um, you'll see that many of the divinities in Tantrism wear a garland of skulls. And that's, those skulls symbolize those egos, those little cages. It's the eye. Those are the eyes. And it's in that way that little by little we free ourselves from karma, from suffering, from pain, from discursive emotions, from doubt. There's another question. The question is about avoiding situations and also the need for a psychological gymnasium. So long as the ego is alive, we will be in a psychological gymnasium no matter what we do. In the past age, the impulse of the spiritual traditions was to isolate the spiritual aspirant from the world. To take the spiritual aspirant out of the cities, out of the towns, out of the villages, and put them in remote locations so they could work on themselves. To go into a monastery or to go into a hermitage or an ashram 
in order to meditate, in order to understand themselves. Part of the driving idea behind that um, teaching was to put the aspirant in a given environment within which they could work at a certain pace without being so overwhelmed with all of the many distractions of life. But in this current age, there's no longer time for this kind of behavior. The ego is so deep and strong, we need to work directly on the causes of our suffering. And those causes are revealed precisely in our day-to-day life. The best place for us to learn about ourselves is exactly where our karma has put us. And yet, we have to make smart choices. Each of us are very weak. We're weak in accordance to the vulnerabilities that our ego provides us with. We are all in suffering because we are vulnerable. We give in to certain kinds of temptation, certain kinds of desire. So we have to be judicious. We have to be intelligent. We have to be in balance. Isolating ourselves from our fellow men can be useful at times, and at other times it can be harmful. It's up to each of us to determine how much we can take, how much we can manage. But know this. If you enter into this science, if you seriously take upon yourself the work to liberate your mind, to liberate your soul, You will be given ordeals. You will be tested. You will be tempted. You will be challenged. And you need that. The only way to advance in these studies is to overcome temptation. The only way to comprehend your karma is to face it. We gain nothing by running away. We only perpetuate our suffering. We only delay the inevitable. So you see there are some extremes here. We need to be in the middle, neither seeking after suffering nor avoiding it, but to be in the middle, to accept what comes and to transform that as best we can and to keep going. There's no need for us to seek out problems. Neither is a need for us to avoid problems. You have to be in the balance, in the middle. Little by little, we learn how to do that. Another question? Can you elaborate on the Tower of Babel or the three lower types of people? The question is about the Tower of Babel and the three lower types of persons. Really, that's the topic for an entire lecture. Uh, But briefly, in the Bible, there's a story about the Tower of Babel, which represents humanity trying to reach God through their own means through constructing a great tower. And that tower has many levels of significance. But in context of this lecture, that Tower of Babel is construed of intellectual types of people, emotional types of people, and motor, instinctive, or sexual types of people, those three groups. And these three groups are people that have certain psychological idiosyncrasies. The intellectuals see everything through the intellect. The emotional types see everything through the emotions. The motor instinctive sexual types see everything through instinct, through habit, through sex. Naturally, none of them understand the others. A marriage or friendship between an emotional person and an intellectual person will have constant arguments, misunderstandings, fighting, because they speak a different language. They understand things a different way. The proper entrance into real self-knowledge is in the fourth type of person, which is someone who has equilibriated the centers. The type of person who's become conscious of these centers and is no longer habitually perceiving life through one or another center. They have acquired a degree of psychological equilibrium within which 
they are conscious of themselves. No longer mechanically going through life as an intellectual person or an emotional person or a motor instinctual sexual person. Beyond this fourth type are other types, five, six, and seven. And these types are related to the solar bodies. But again, this is a whole lecture we'll come to another day. Any other questions? Yes. The question is, can we reverse the catastrophes of humanity? If you change the causes, the effects will change. You mean it was physical? No matter what level, the effects are manifest. If you suffer an illness and you change the causes of that illness, the illness will go away. This is true of anything, whether it's physical or in the astral plane or mental plane whatever level. But that change has to be accomplished in accordance with karma. Karma is the overriding factor. As an example, if you have a certain type of illness in your body, your physical body, and you discover that that illness has been caused by a certain food that you've been eating that disagrees with you, you can pray all you want, but if you keep eating that food, your body will stay sick. Right? Simple. But if you stop eating that food, that illness will go away when the karma is satisfied. You see? So even if you take away the food, that illness cannot leave until the karma of those actions is resolved. And this is why we have to meditate and, and awaken consciousness so that we can understand the karma. So in relation to humanity as a whole, yes, we can make a direct impact, a sustained impact on the suffering of humanity through our prayer, through our actions, through learning how to behave better, through learning how to help each other, but most especially by eradicating our own ego, which contributes to the suffering of humanity. This has a direct impact. There's no question about it. Yet there's karma. It's like to, to change uh, the inevitable of can you or should we end death? To die in all in agony, but uh, pleasant death. Exactly. It's a very good analogy. The analogy given is we will all die. This is unavoidable. But it's kind of up to us whether we die pleasantly and peacefully or in great pain. And the same is true of humanity. Humanity now is dying a very agonizing death. But the more people who seriously work on themselves, who seriously work to transform their own mind, that impacts the agony of humanity and begins to reduce that pain. The end will come. This is unavoidable but the intensity of the catastrophes can be changed. Yes? You mentioned about the technique of no orgasm and meditation. Mm -hmm. So no orgasm, that's the, the state. So what is the technique for that? Okay. And when you say meditation, what do you mean by meditation? Okay. Meditation has so many times that um, that's one approach for Well, there are th the question you've asked uh, to fully answer it would require a lot of study. So there are many aspects. But in brief, uh, in this tradition we study tantrism. But the teachings of tantra are organized according to certain um, approaches to the science. And there are three primary approaches. 
This school is what we would call a white tantric school. This school here, Gnosis, or the tradition of Samael and Vior. This is called a white tantric school. And this is uh, a school that teaches the same methodology that you'll find in Vajrayana Buddhism or original Chan Buddhism, Zen Buddhism, and much of Hindu Tantra. It is originally a form of white Tantra, and it's called white because it is a school that is pure. No ego. This is the goal, to become white like with, in, terms of, in terms of purity and transparent, exactly. You also have schools. Now, the basic, the basic um, differentiating factor to a school that teaches white tantrism is precisely the elimination and uh, the practice of no orgasm to completely restrain the sexual impulse, to completely sublimate the sexual energy. No orgasm. So that could take the energy for transformation. All of that energy has to be sublimated. To, be, it, to completely eradicate the animal impulse, exactly. The second type of school is called gray because it's a mixture of the white and the black. Black schools teach how to awaken consciousness through the orgasm, by having the orgasm, by indulging in sensation, by utilizing the animal forces in order to awaken consciousness. A gray school teaches to occasionally orgasm, right? So there are a lot of Taoist schools that are what we would call a gray school because they teach to orgasm sometimes. The difference is this. Someone who harnesses the power of sexuality but keeps the ego alive but indulges in desire creates a demon becomes a devil because the ego is made fat. It's made strong. Someone who practices white tantra totally eliminates the I, utilizes all that energy to completely destroy the animal mind and to create a solar mind or a Christ mind which is free of individuality, which is free of I, free of desire. And a gray school mixes these ideas and concepts, but generally precipitates the disciples into black tantra because they don't fully understand how to eliminate the ego. So those are the differences between them. In terms of meditation, there, as you pointed out, there are many ways to meditate, many techniques. And in this tradition, we study many different approaches to the practice of meditation. The core practice is a form of pradimoksha, a form of dzogchen or vajrayana meditation or mahamudra, which is a technique within which the consciousness is extracted from the ego so that it's free of any discursive influence. And from that position, which is called samadhi or satori, the consciousness can then directly analyze the ego in order to destroy it. And this is acquired through the process of samadhi or satori. So other schools also teach how to acquire samadhi or satori or ecstasies. And, but again, the differentiating factor here is the white one teaches mystical death, which is the death of the desire, the de- death of the eye. So the two factors so far are birth through transmutation of the sexual energy. This is the second birth where we create the soul. The second is death, which is where we use those energies to destroy the I. And the third is sacrifice, which is how we then dedicate ourselves to assist others. It's related. Those teachers, Ospensky and Bennett, were students of this tradition.
Well, it's slightly different because Ospensky and Bennett and other students of that tradition only received a small percentage of the teaching. They didn't get the whole teaching. Gurdjieff, who was their teacher, acquired his doctrine from Tibet, but he didn't teach them everything because he himself didn't have everything. It's related. I know, but yeah, it's not all. No, it's not all from Gurdjieff. No, it's the original roots of this teaching are far older than Gurdjieff, even far older than Tibet. They're ancient, so you can study those other schools and find useful elements, but you won't find the whole teaching there. Which are important. They are important tools. That's, those are useful tools, but that's not the main tools that you guys work on. Exactly. Just not everything. But, uh, so how do you control uh, orgasm or no orgasm? By not engaging in it or by avoiding it? No. The, the proper sexuality is natural to the human organism. We are sexual creatures. But we have to learn to use our sexual power with responsibility. And that responsibility lies directly between fornication and um, abstinence, what people call abstinence. So neither totally rejecting sex nor totally indulging in it, but being in the middle. Exactly. So you see two sides of that pendulum, right? You see those who abstain from sex completely and those who indulge in sex completely. Both are mistaken. We have to use sexuality, but with responsibility. Okay, and that's the key thing. The word, I mean, but what does it mean by responsibility? And how do you, and what is the middle line? Or right. not the middle line, what is the balance? Where is the point? And how do you measure that point? The balance there is taking all that sexual power and recirculating it through the organism in order to heal the organism and remove desire, remove the ego. And that's the ancient science of alchemy, which is to transform lead into gold. Those, well, meditation and, and different movements, whether they're yantric movements or the Gurdjieffian movements or runic postures or Egyptian postures, all those movements are designed to help us develop cognizant or conscious control over our energies. But first of all, the energy has to be there. When we fornicate, when we, fornicate we, we throw away the energy. We release that. Exactly. Energy. Exactly. Different ways to harness it and utilize it. Yeah. So let me let me close the lecture there, and then okay. we'll come to the next. The next lecture, yeah, we'll go into those topics more in detail. Thank you. Gnostic Radio is made possible through the financial support of listeners like you. To make a tax-deductible donation, visit our website at GnosticTeachings.org. For questions about this or other lectures, we invite you to participate in the free discussion forum at GnosticTeachings.org. Thank you for your support. May all beings be happy.